there are blue pieces of just silk fiber all over this room. When I'm done filming, I plan to do a lot of vacuuming in this apartment. Hey guys, I'm AHE Designs and welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's happened, it's done, part of it's done, but I have made a piece of my Snow White cosplay from Mirror Mirror. As many of you know, I've been working on this cosplay since January of 2021 and I'm finally done a piece of the costume that's actually visible on the costume. All the understructure has been done for a while now, and I've finally finished a piece from the gown, the iconic blue and orange gown. So today I'm going to be showing you how I made it. I'll tell you all about all the different steps I took and all the different little elements on the skirt, because maybe to some of you it looks a little simple on the surface, but there's actually a lot more going on than meets the eye on this thing. I'm extremely proud of this piece, and I'm really excited to show you all how I made it. Now, earlier in the year, I made all the patterns for the skirt. So all the skirts are self-drafted, based on the understructure I'd already made, which have videos on my channel as well for the petticoat and the hoop skirt underneath as well, which is keeping this lovely bell shape. So since I had my understructure, I then knew what shape I needed the rest of the dress to be. And it turns out that the hoop skirt has a little bit of extra oomph in the back. So I wanted to make a circle skirt, but it had to be a little bit offset, more of an oval skirt. So I did draft that all from scratch. I had done several mock-ups once I knew that it was all good to go, I ordered my fabric. I'm not planning to edit this video visually because it doesn't need it, <laughs> needless to say. There's no visual color editing on this at all. This is the natural vibrancy of these fabrics. For a costume, I really wanted to try to use silkbaron.com because their silks have such high quality according to other cosplayers and other people I follow. So I really, really wanted to use some of their products and I'm really glad I did because I think the colors that I used are absolutely perfect. Now, I don't have any footage of me actually cutting out any of the pieces because my boss was very, very kind and let me cut everything out at work because these pieces are very, very large, very large. And I not only didn't have enough room to cut out all the different pieces in my sewing room floor, but the thought of my beautiful silk dufioni on the floor hurt my soul a little bit. But once all of these pieces were cut out, it was actually time to put them together. Now this skirt is made up of two skirts. There is the bottom skirt in this lovely dark blue and the overskirt. Both of them are made using the same pattern essentially. And just one is obviously a lot shorter and has a little bit extra volume on the bottom. They start off being constructed almost the exact same. All the seams are done with French seams. So bad side to bad side, seaming that up and then pressing that and reseaming it again. So we have a nice enclosed finished seam. It looks absolutely beautiful in this silk. So both skirts, all the seams are finished in that exact same way. And on the center back, both skirts have a center back overlapped placket. That's because if there's any weight gain or fluctuation, it gives me some extra overlap to play with as opposed to a zipper, which leaves me at just that size. Now, while the skirts were put together quite similarly, there is a major difference in the actual construction because for the most part, it was just French seaming seams together. Well, the upper skirt has pockets. See that pocket? Now, they were just inseam pockets, which has a very simple application, but pockets on the upper skirt is so, so handy. And to French seam them in, I just had to apply them to the side seams first match them up and then I just French seamed as I did normally and would press them in and out of the way because of course it's a little different to press when there's a big old pocket in the way. Because of the way I cut everything, the side seams where the pockets are, are on a selvage edge. And that was intentional so I wouldn't have to worry about fraying around that zone because they're very, very sneaky. You can hardly see them. They're within some little pleated gathers over here. It's handy having a costume I can actually put pockets in. I'm very happy about that. Both skirts do have horsehair hem in it or flat crinoline, six inch variety from Farthingdale. This stuff adds a lot of extra body to the hems of these skirts and makes it way more flouncy and really, really elegant, which I really, really love about this stuff. If you saw my video about petticoats, I used it in there as well. Now, a difference from the way I apply it on the petticoat is that I want to put a facing on these pieces because Flat crinoline is usually either black or white. It's not like you can have all these different fun colors. And if I twirl in this, I didn't want a bunch of white or black to stick out. So I decided to add a cotton facing. The facing pieces are all based off of the hem circumference and six inches up from there. So they fit quite perfectly into the final skirt pieces and match up at all the seam lines, which is very, very, very satisfying to look at at the end. 
just like on my petticoat, I applied the horsehair hem, but in this case, while sandwiching the hem and the horsehair hem, I was also sandwiching in that facing piece. Now, where these two hems differ is the way I decided to apply them in the end. Obviously, both hems have quite the difference. The bottom hem is plain, and the top hem has all the detail on it. And because of that, I decided to finish them quite differently. For the bottom hem, I ended up stitching the facing to the horsehair. But at that point, if I didn't add in some extra top stitching on top, the horsehair hem would just keep falling out. So I had to add something. Most of the times, especially on my petticoat, you just stitch it up into place, but then I'd have this long stitching line six inches above my finished hem, and I did not want that. Though that would have been the faster way to do it. So I hand sewed it all on. Now this bottom hem has a little over eight meters of circumference. Over eight meters of horsehair hem and over eight meters of facing, which at this point were all attached to each other and needed to get attached to this actual skirt. So I hand sewed it all up with a slip stitch. I was expecting this to take me weeks to do, but luckily it did not. I just pushed through it. I was watching some Critical Role and I had a great time. I really, really enjoy hand sewing, but if I didn't, I probably would have absolutely loathed this part of the costume. That was that. I pinned it all in place and I just very carefully hand stitched it into place. The result is very, very nice. You can still kind of tell if there's stitching there and you can tell there's a facing in there, but you don't see that stitching line running all the way around, which is super satisfying. The threads that I did slip stitch in there just get hidden inside all the slubs of the Silk Dupioni. And the finished result on the inside is also gorgeous because you still don't see that stitching line and it just kind of looks like it's floating there but it's well attached. It's not going anywhere. I'm overall very happy with that finish on the bottom skirt. Now the top skirt is where things get interesting especially because of all the detail on it. So we're going to start with how it differs from the bottom skirt. So as mentioned before, both of the skirts were attached the same way in the beginning because the horsehair hem and the facing were attached together. Something that differs on this one is that there's an extra little detail on the facing itself. Now, I mentioned this on my Snow White planning video, but when I was doing research on this costume, there's a photo where the hem's flipped up a bit and you can see the actual facing. So it is a faced skirt. So I got that part right. But she also has this little scalloped lace on the inside attached to the facing. So I have a little scalloped lace all around the top of the facing. This wasn't a very complicated difference from the first one. It was just adding a little trim to the top of the facing. So this part's actually pretty similar, except there's lace. And it's honestly really pretty. So anytime my skirt flips up, you'll just see this little pretty touch of pretty lace sticking out. So if I twirl enough, you see a little bit of my white petticoat underneath and a little bit of white lace, it's gonna look really, really cute. Then I had to make some decisions because I had to start dealing with attaching the facing to the skirt, but also having all of this lovely detail on there. I knew I had to put these details on and I had to attach the facing up. So before I could do anything, I needed to get the flowers into place. And that's because I wanted to use my mother's Cricut. If you don't know what a Cricut is, it is a cutter, a cutting machine, and it can cut out all sorts of different things. One of which being press on vinyl, which is an absolute, it's just a magic thing to use. My boyfriend actually created the vector images based off of the flower details on the actual dress and sent them over to my mom who got them cut on cornflower blue press on matte vinyl. So we had a nice little day one day, her and I were peeling all of these pieces off of the off the sticky stuff and she brought over her pressing machine and I got to use it for the first time, which was really, really cool. It has a timer on it and it made it really, really fast to get these flowers on there. When I made this costume originally when I was 18 years old, I literally drew it on with something akin to a Sharpie. It looked okay, but it was not the cleanest application. <laughs> this is so clean and so satisfying. And within an hour and a half, I had them all applied. Now I needed to apply these to the skirt before I attached the horsehair hem up to the skirt because I was super worried that that pressing machine would actually melt the horsehair. But it luckily did not because I had it pushed out of the way for the time being. So now with my flowers attached, it was time to actually sew up that horsehair hem, which I just did with a machine stitch across the very top. In this case, I knew I was going to be able to hide those stitches in the pleating detail I was going to be adding later on. 
so I didn't have to worry about a visible top stitch being seen all around the circumference of the hem like I was worried with the bottom because it would get hidden. So the next thing of note on this skirt, obviously, are the pleats. This lovely pleated trim you see all around this top skirt. What I ended up doing was measuring the hem of the skirt and multiplying that by three, twice, because there's two rows of this stuff which came up to 1,620 inches, which is about 40 meters, apparently. And that's how much trim I needed. So in total, I had 30 strips that were two inches wide and 54 inches long. That was a lot, but luckily very quick to seam together because it was only two and a half inch seams. This fabric, as gorgeous as it is, frays a lot. So I had to serge all four edges because there's two pieces and two finished edges on each side. I surged. 20 meters, 20 meters, 20 meters, and 20 meters again. The surging took quite a long time, and unfortunately surging is not as relaxing to me as other forms of sewing. And once it was done, I didn't have to deal with the fraying pieces of blue everywhere. Now obviously you're not seeing surging on this finished piece, you're not seeing those edges, and that's because I ended up folding those edges in and overlapping each other, which you can see me doing right here. So I turned them into a long folded strip. So it was folded in on itself, with a little bit of overlap so I could then create the pleats where I stitched on later. Originally I tried doing the tube method of creating the strips, hiding a seam on the inside and then turning it all inside out. That did not work. The function of pulling the tube inside out actually warps the fabric a whole lot. You see here you can see a little bit of the overlocks underneath, stitched up, tucked away where you'll never see them unless you pull it up like that. So once both of my 20 meter long strips were completed and all folded and pressed nicely, it was time to actually pleat them onto the skirt. A lot of people say how tedious it seemed, but I'm not gonna lie, I actually really, really enjoyed this part. All these pleats are knife pleats, meaning all of the pleats are going in the same exact direction, and they're about the width of a popsicle stick. I say that because I was actually originally using a popsicle stick as my point of measure, essentially, rolling the pleats over the popsicle stick to get my width. In the end though, I did not have to do that anymore because once I started actually getting it onto the skirt, I was able to just eyeball it. I was just looking at it, following along, and I was able to get them pretty darn evenly. I got a few comments from people saying how impressed they were with how even I did it and wondering how I did that. The answer is popsicle sticks and eyeballing it, apparently, because that's how I did it. It took me around four hours total, so two hours per application, and they end up looking so good. When I compare it to my old costume where I just kind of ruffled on a different color ribbon at random, this is so much more satisfying and just so pretty in the final product. Now something I will admit on the details of the skirt is that they're not done the same exact way as the skirt in the film that I'm recreating this costume from. And I mean that in the sense that if you look at the costume from the film, you can actually tell that the flowers are on a separate piece on top and they're on top of, looks like one strip that is pleated and then they're on top of the skirt and the facing. In this case, I think what they did was they sewed up the top strip the flowers would go on, sent it out to the embroiderer who did the used an embroiderer machine, and then sent it back to them and they just put it on top of the pleated detail. Now, there's obviously some reasons I didn't do that because first off, I am not a grand production. I don't have the tools and resources that Aiko Ishioka had when she was creating the original costume, as well as I'm one person with one budget. Most of the money went into the fabric at this point. So if I can find a way to save money, even on a big, bigger budget costume like this one, I will. So if I had done it the same way, this would have been super, super heavy, but also would have been a ton of fabric. These pleats would have been super, super wide. It would have just been very heavy and not very practical use of my money and my time. But I think this worked really, really well, even if it's not screen accurate. And to finish off the skirt, once all the details were on there, I just had to add on the waistband, which is a rectangular piece that is based off the size of the waist of the skirt. I did have to pleat on the overskirt, because there's a little bit of extra gathering around the back, but besides that, I was done the skirt of the costume. So in all, this skirt took me around a month to create. I'm glad I put in the time and effort, because I am really, really proud of this piece. This is the most beautiful garment I have ever made, so far at least. If you've liked this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and all that good stuff, and stick around because we're getting closer to the, to the finale of this costume. Theoretically, there's two more parts to go. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. See you guys later.